think uh, we're already in 2 p.m. sharp. Uh, I think we can start now. Uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mustafa Khalifa. I'm a member of the Energy Institute. Uh, as well, I'm going to be your lovely moderator for this webinar event. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, make a quick reminder for our audience that uh, our session, it might going to be extend another 15 minutes um, in the Q&A session. Um, and if you have any questions, please uh, directly put your question in our Q&A box or in the chat that you can see it here. Uh, without further ado, allow us to start. Um, as is the theme or the topics of the today webinar represent itself, the impact of the pandemic on the oil industry and the transition to renewable energy. Uh, as we all can see that in our current time, the world we live in uh, is facing one of the worst pandemics. Uh, this pandemic affected many areas of our lives and multiple industries as well. And in this webinar, we will be talking how it has affected the oil and gas industry, as well as the possible transition to renewable energy. As you can see here, we have our respective speakers. Uh, we're going to start by, with by Dr. Adlan Abdurrahman. Dr. Adlan is going to address to us the, the Energy Institute in Malaysia. And also Dr. Adlan is the chairman for the Energy Institute in Malaysia Society. This is also the uh, associate professor in Herwat University. Second speaker, we have Mr. Alan Wallace. Alan Wallace is going to address, about, uh, address us the, the impact of the pandemic on the oil industry. Mr. Allen also he is in the country representative for the Energy Institute in Malaysia, also the principal consultor engineer. Third speaker, we have Mr. Austin Lee. Mr. Austin is going to address to us the transition to renewable energy. Mr. Austin also the environmental sustainable designer consultor, as well as the certified green RE manager. And last speaker, we have Ms. Lisa Ong. Ms. Lisa Ong, she is going to address to us the renewable energy and the challenges and the opportunities. She's also the Chief Financial Officer in the Renewable Energy Solar Resource in Malaysia. But before we start to our today's session, this important part that I need to address to you, which is to introduce you to about us. Who are we? Who are we, the Energy Institute, and who are the Young Professional Network? The Energy Institute, known as EI, is a professional organization for the engineers and other professionals in energy-related field. The EI was formed in 2003 with the merge of the Institute of Petroleum dating back to 1930 and the Institute of Energy dating back to 1925. And the Young Professional Network, known as YPN, is a part of the Energy Institute acting as the hub for tomorrow's energy leaders. Our mission is to draw together cross discipline energy professional, diverse background to learn about the discuss key engineering issues. Their professional network is a collective of 15 international and regional brands, but also they engage in topical issues across the industry and continuously expanding the professional network to benefit the development and careers of its member. Going next with the um, intensive from by the Energy Institute known as the Generation 2050. And let me just introduce you a bit about Generation 2050. 2050 is a global young professional network and our partners that aims to provide a platform for young professionals around the world to have a louder voice in the big debate about climate change and also access to energy and energy sources with a three basic aim factor. Firstly, distilling and amplifying a positive vision for change in response to those to these urgent global challenges. Secondly, conveying to today energy leaders the view and opinions of those who will inherit the sector and plan after them. And thirdly, inspiring young people to stay in the sector and others to join in. Basically, we want our young professional to be heard. Not forget to mention at the heart of Generation 2050, the survey, which we are launching today with this event to capture views and perspective from around the world. And if you are 35 or under and working in our, or studying engineering, please after this webinar to visit the Generation 2050 web, uh, web page and complete the survey. The survey will be sent around everyone following the event, or you can visit it in our website. 
Don't forget to mention also that we are keen to make this session interactive as we can hear your vision and have a proper and have we and we have prepared a few questions for you. Those questions are for you to be summarized for us and also to engage with the speakers later on when they are presenting. And lastly, at the end of the short presentation, we are going to have a question and answer panel session with all our speakers. For the question and answer, please direct your question in the question and answer box. You can post those questions throughout the session and those will be addressed during the panel discussion. Please state your name and the speaker that you are directing your question to and we will answer as many questions as possible. Without further ado, allow us to start our first polling question and I encourage all the audience to participate and, the answer, and answer the question that they feel or and heard it that is got the best answer. So we're having our first polling question, which is, to what extent has COVID impact the pace of change toward renewable energy? We have three answers here. First answer is to a great extent. Second, no impact. And third, to a lesser extent. Are we going to give another 20 seconds for our audience to choose in their opinion, which is the suitable answer for this question? So wait for you to answer. Please, all the audience, um, do participate and do answer the question. Okay, um, as you can see, the results uh, in, in, in for the panel polling question, uh, we have uh, around um, twenty percent of the audience answering to a great extent, and a few who are not answering. Nevertheless, um, uh, please for the audience uh, in the next polling question, please do participate and do answer as uh, as it's not going to take much time. Without further ado, allow us to start with our first speaker, which is Dr. Adlan Abdurrahman, which is going to address to us the Energy Institute in Malaysia. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Adlan. Okay, thank you very much, Mushtaba. And welcome everyone to what is our second uh, virtual event held in Malaysia. As introduced earlier, I'm Adlan Shah Abdurrahman, and I'm an associate professor at Herod Ward University. I've been involved in energy research, particularly in the renewable energy, for just over 20 years now. I'm only sharing two slides just to introduce the EI Malaysia Society and to give a bit of background of what the EI do here in Malaysia. Okay, as you can see on the slide, the EI Malaysia Society was formally registered with the Registrar of Societies Malaysia in 2012. Our roles can be listed as to organize or host EI events and activities, to support EI representatives in meeting members' requests, uh, such as if there's any issues on applications or registrations, and to help expand the EI network in Malaysia in general and the Southeast Asian region. Now, on the left-hand side of the slides, I have shared some pictures of our previous activities. And of course, this was done during the uh, before the pandemic and the MCOs. Eh? We are no longer allowed to gather, isn't it? So we've been uh, conducting um, expert speaker talks or one or one and a half days technical workshops. And the last picture at the bottom shows uh, from our previous biogas workshop, where we had a good attendees, a good mix of attendees from industry, academia, and also representatives of various government agencies. So these kind of activities, our talks and our uh, workshops is a good platform. Eh? for members and non-members alike from the industry to network. Now going uh, to the top of the pictures, that is the one and a half gigawatt combined cycle gas power plant in Port Dixon. Uh, so we also visited the uh, biomass pellet producing plant. 
We also uh, had a visit on the Energy Commission headquarters as well. So there's a lot of activities that caters to the broad range of our members. Now, the last point I want to share in this slide is the Learning Affiliates Network that we have managed to promote over the years. We now have five universities with active learning affiliate memberships. So you can see the, the logos of these universities on the right hand side. And uh, pardon my shameless plug here, Herod Watt University in Putrajaya is the only one that is MSc programs and petroleum engineering degree to be accredited by the EI as well. Now, being a learning affiliate allows all the students to apply for a free EI student grade membership during the course of their studies. So this grants them access to uh, our vast network of people and knowledge. Next slide, please. Now, the EI in Malaysia has over just over 350 members. And if you look at the heat map, we are actually well spread out throughout the country with higher concentrations in the more industrialized areas. In Peninsula Malaysia, we are in the Klang Valley, Ipoh and Kuantan areas. And in East Malaysia, we are more in Kuching, Miri and Kota Kinabalu. Yeah, but you can find all our members throughout the country. Our records show that around 14% of this uh, has a professional registration or chartered. And the breakdown is shown in the graph. As you can see, if even if you're not from an engineering background, you can still have a chartered energy manager or chartered environmentalist through the Energy Institute. Next, please. Uh, so in this graph, I'm not going to go over all the numbers, but I'm just sharing to show that we have a very diverse fields of area related to energy, from engineering to agriculture, law and policy making, as well as education and training. Uh, so if you are in the business or you are in the energy sector, uh, we, we have a very broad uh, areas of broad background of members for you to network. Okay, I will stop here now and I will answer any question at the end of the webinar. Thank you again for having me, and I'll pass the session back to you, Mustaba. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Adlan. Um, and like uh, Mr. Adlan said, that the membership is quite crucial, especially for everyone uh, who is interested to learn more about energy around us and the opportunities that might uh, represent uh, itself. We all need to have a membership since there's no much to learn, and then it. In the Energy Institute platform, there is many opportunities where students and professionals can learn from. All that in one website, which is the Energy Institute website. But I thought I was to go to the next topic. Uh, but before we go into it, we have another polling question. And the second poll question say that by 2050, the renewable energy sector will provide more employment opportunities compared to the COVID. Uh, conventional energy sector. What are your view on this? Do you agree with the statement or you disagree or you are part the same? So we have another for the second for the audience to answer. Please participate all of you and uh, for you to we ask also to understand your view on this. I'll give you time to answer. Please take it up.
Okay, um, as a question, I've been asked for the polling question. Uh, we have a 57% uh, of our audience uh, agreed about the statement that has been shared before. Um, thank you for your participation. Uh, without further ado, allow us to go to the next topic um, by Mr. Adlan. Mr. Adlan is going to address to us the impact of the pandemic on the oil industry. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Adlan. Back one slide, please. Good afternoon and uh, uh, welcome to my uh, presentation. So the, the title of uh, my presentation is uh, Conventional versus Renewable Energy and Your Career. Next slide. So how will COVID play a part in changing how we think, consume and manage our energy resources and in doing so, provide you with a wide range of options as you follow your career in the energy sector? The future is bright. The future is full of opportunities. Yes, globally, we've reached that point where the energy transition is tipping in favor of renewables. Although conventional energy will be relied upon as we emerge from COVID-19, there will undoubtedly be pressure from many who will urge governments to ramp up their economies on the back of a renewable energy push. The employment market across all energy sectors has, of course, taken a big hit as manufacturing and energy demand has plummeted. But what does the future hold for energy professionals entering both conventional and renewable energy sectors when energy demand starts to pick up? Next slide. So the journey towards 2050. Are we now entering a key phase in the energy transition as we head towards 2050 and beyond? Well, uh, we know that current methane and CO2 emissions are at an historic low. And the likes of Shanghai, Hong Kong, Manila, Jakarta and Bangkok are enjoying smog-free conditions for the first time in decades. So even in grim circumstances, COVID-19 offers examples of how the greener world might feel and look without conventional energy emissions. The digital revolution has gone into overdrive during COVID, where virtual comms and remote surveillance has taken on new importance. Whilst traditional infrastructure activities, transport systems and commuting has all but ground to a halt, contributing to this reduction in emissions. So, as we increasingly move towards renewables, is it a sure sign that traditional energy opportunities in, for example, the oil and gas industry are numbered? How will this impact jobs? Is there a need to reevaluate academic choices and revise career strategies? Should those, done, uh, should those currently studying or new into the conventional energy sector look at the current situation as a shrinking world of options or see the bigger picture of the energy transition and the opportunities which can be taken into the renewable sector? Next slide. Or will we continue to rely on conventional energy? There is a consensus that methane and CO2 levels will rise again as economies resume, with the main contributors being industry, transportation and power generation, based on this ramp up of conventional energy. But what if conventional energy generators or consumers don't return to pre-COVID levels? Where does this leave those seeking or currently following careers in oil and gas, for example? Supply and demand, if there's less demand, what happens then? In terms of government, uh, sorry, in terms of global commitments, we have a steadfast support amongst most governments who are actively backing renewables and sustainable futures rather than activities linked to conventional energy sources. But where will their allegiance lie when it comes to fast tracking their economies on the back of cheap, available conventional energy versus their longer term commitment to renewables? Let's be honest. Nothing is going to change overnight. Conventional energy will remain part of the energy mix for some years to come. In the next presentation, you'll see how large oil and gas companies are revising their strategies to develop more into cleaner energy associated with renewables. Where you, as students and young professionals, have an advantage is that you have the chance to become the agents of change in terms of managing this energy transition towards renewables. Of course, you should embrace your chosen career path in oil and gas, but stay informed on the energy transition and where you may seek opportunities to 
across the sectors over the next three decades towards 2050. Next slide. How will this energy transition impact you as you move into the employment market? Well, political agendas and economic policies in certain countries do favour conventional energy, but they rely heavily on raw material production, exports, or of high levels of manufacturing, which require readily available and cheap energy. Because oil and gas prices are at an historic low, it makes sense, makes business sense to reinvest. Although this means more methane and CO2 emissions in the short to medium term, economies will more readily turn a blind eye, in my opinion in favour of bringing their economies back from the brink as quickly as possible after this COVID uh, situation. Existing infrastructure and distribution networks using tried and tested technologies will make the uh, decision-making easier in the face of higher cost renewable energy projects. But history, as we know, has a habit of repeating itself. So will this impact decision-making, for oil and gas especially, governments will need to seriously consider the increasing frequency of boom bust cycles where cheap fuels today can be super expensive tomorrow based on market sensitivities and forces political spats and changes in government policies employment demographics in oil and gas show that choices made by young professionals are of key importance as you as i mentioned earlier represent the voice of the future and can take this opportunity not only to trigger change but make it happen in a controlled way knowing that conventional energy will still continue to offer relatively good employment opportunities as it approaches its twilight years. Next slide. Opportunities across the energy sectors are there for the taking. Across all levels, from technical to non-technical, opportunities for those who have the inclination and ambition to seek them out range from research to front-end design, project management, construction, Commissioning, ops, maintenance, and front lines hands on. The opportunities are there for the taking. For example, one former colleague in well engineering has recently taken on the role as project manager for his company's geothermal drilling program in the Philippines. Austin will touch on opportunities as part of his, of his energy transition presentation. And in the final presentation, Lisa will describe in a bit more detail how solar PV energy in Malaysia is increasingly becoming a key energy source which will require support from future energy professionals such as yourselves. So, as you can see on the whole, there are many skills and competencies which span across the sectors. For those of you who have concerns about the way the energy mix and energy transition may affect your career choices, keep a wide open mind on what's happening across all energy sectors, and in the same way mix and transition yourselves as and when the opportunities present themselves. Next slide. So just to summarize, for all of you who are or soon will be stakeholders in the energy sector, it's more important than ever that you have your say. And through the Energy Institute, we all have a voice at the highest level and at the cutting edge of our chosen sector's journey through the energy transition. Now is the time to act. What we are witnessing is an unprecedented global crisis. And with this comes an openness for new ideas, innovation. And from your side, it's a call for action. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Allen. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Allen highlighted here, that um, the importance of the energy in our life is quite crucial. Uh, and the world has seen a huge shift from conventional oil methods and unconventional. Or in general, the conventional methods where energy, energy used to be produced from into renewable, which will have less footprint and will affect our nation less as compared to previously. Uh, without further ado, allow us to go to the next topic, which is transition to renewable energy. But before we go to the uh, second topic, uh, we have another, our last polling question, which the question is, what drives the piece of the energy transition? First, answer, pandemics. Second, government policies. Third, technological invention. Fourth, cost, and lastly, in user demand uh, so we give the audience uh, another one minute for them to answer so take your time
we have about 30 seconds before we release the results for our polling question. Please, for those who have not yet to answer, please do answer. Right, I think the time's up for our polling question, and the results are as follows. Um, we have a 34 percent which are the choosing that the government policies are the driving the for the piece of the energy transition. Um, without further ado, I'll ask to go to the next topic, which is transition to renewable energy, which is going to be addressed by Mr. Austin. Mr. Austin, please, everyone, welcome, Mr. Austin. Okay, so I'll be today I'll be focusing on the transition uh, to renewable energy. Next slide, please. Okay, through this pandemic, we know that the area with uh, air, air pollution is greatly affected by COVID-19. People with uh, asthma may be at high risk of getting sick from uh, COVID-19. According to the researcher from Harvard University, one microgram per meter cube increase in the particulate matter PM2.5 is actually associated with the 8% increase in COVID-19 death rate. Also, according to the study by Greenpeace, there are more than 6 million of premature death uh, are actually caused by the air pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and PM2.5. And just by about 67% of this amount is merely contributed by PM2.5. By just looking at the uh, Southeast Asia case, the premature death caused by PM2.5 is already uh, 150,000 cases per year. It's very sad to see this because uh, this element could have been avoided for both the climate and the health crisis. Next, please. Okay, the true cause of fossil fuel. One of the major sources of air pollution is, is the uh, transportation. And for your information, the retail price of petrol in Malaysia is actually controlled and subsidized uh, by the government. As you can see from the graph above here, in 2014, the fuel subsidy uh, is, uh, is about 6.53 billion US dollar. And by just two years' time, which is 2016, the amount is almost double uh, the amount in 2014, which comes to nearly 12 billion US dollar. Looking at the newspaper uh, right bottom there, so they actually highlighted that the cost of damage to health and environment is not uh, reflected in the current price of fossil fuel. An IMF study, which is the International Monetary Fund, showed that the annual cost to Malaysia society from domestic fossil fuel use is 88 billion ringgit Malaysia, which makes the 0 0.8 billion cost is uh, in the severe haze years looks minuscule in comparison, which is 100 times of the cost. Uh, looking at the other side, so this is another study by IMF. Here highlighted that the true cost of fossil fuel should actually include the cost of uh, four elements. First, should include the cost of uh, health costs from the uh, air pollution. Second, damage from climate change. Third, traffic congestion and accidents. And fourth, the subsidies which are currently paid by the government. But what about the other three elements? Is anyone paying for that? The answer is no, none of the petrol consumer is paying for that. That makes the actual cost spent on fossil fuel each year comes to about 5.3 trillion uh, US dollar, which is equivalent to the 6.5 of the global GDP, which is the gross domestic product. Next, please. Okay, when it comes to energy pricing, it's just like the picture over here. There's always an elephant in the room. No one wants to mention or discuss about this because it makes some, at least some of them feel uncomfortable or they may find this issue as sensitive and controversial. Looking at the picture on the right hand side, there are two teams on the football badge. So first team, grey team represents the fossil fuel and the green team which represents the energy efficiency and renewable energy. You may find that's one uncommon thing here from what you normally see during a football match. The playing field is slanted and imbalanced. The grey team goal is actually at a higher side which makes the green team more difficult to tackle and score any points. And this actually reflects the current situation of fossil fuel and renewable energy. Fossil fuel gets subsidized and underpriced. In 2018, Malaysia has set a target of uh, having 20% of the renewable energy in generation mixed by 2025. 
In order to achieve this, a level playing field must be created. Next. Okay, figures here shows the energy major, which are the leading point in this company's transition strategy to green. Solar and wind are tackling, uh, are taking an increasingly important role in the energy industry. And that oil and gas majors are progressively positioning themselves in the uh, energy transition. As you can see the, in the figure here, the six euro based major has actually launched uh, more enthusiastically into renewables than the other two US big companies, which have the Chevron and ExxonMobil. Both of these companies have taken an approach that is more closely aligned with their traditional business model, uh, focusing on the improved efficiency, uh, increased uh, biofuel production and the CCUS, which is the carbon capture, utilization and storage. Instead of replacing the world existing power generation system, they are collaborating with others and researching more effective uh, technologies to capture the carbon they emit. And of course, this could lower the cost of transition. So those oil and gas producers that stay at, on the sideline and resist a bigger shift in model may find themselves uh, have missed out of wood later on. Next. Okay, the impact of COVID-19 on renewable energy growth. We do see there's uh, going to be more growth in renewables, but slower than if we had not had the COVID-19 crisis. There are a lot of uh, project delays and cancellation, mainly due to the cutback in capital spending. The complete or partial lockdowns has also triggered the supply chain disruption and some of the commissioning works. For instance, Malay, uh, most of the solar equipment are imported from uh, China. Other than that, the energy demand in transportation and uh, industry has also reduced uh, due to the restriction on business activities and travel. The uh, table below here shows the poly change of policy uh, of different countries, which will uh, further extend the renewable energy development. It's lucky that it's just extension, not cancellation. Next, please. Finally, the green wave is coming. In June last year, something remarkable happened in Danish general election. The main issue of the election campaign was not uh, about the economy or job creation, but it's about climate change. Hence, this was termed as the first climate election in Denmark. And looking at the graph uh, on the left-hand side, a climate change survey has been carried out to nearly 28,000 of the respondents from different nations. The overall result shows that 68% of the people labor is a major threat, and just only 9% of the people believe that climate change is not a threat. Malaysia was not among the poor country, but our neighbor country, Indonesia, has more than half of the population see climate change as a major threat. In the past, 100% of our energy sources, such as coal and petroleum, are from underground. The picture on the right actually means that the energy solution of tomorrow are no longer found below the ground. It's time to utilize the renewable sources such as uh, sun and wind to utilize the forces of nature to ride the green wave. Last, I would like to end with two quotes. Next, please. Okay, first, is the climate change... Uh, as an existential threat by uh, U.S. Secretary General. And the second one is from the chief economics of World Bank. The climate crisis is our third world war and needs a bold re response because we cannot afford not to act as our civilization is at stake. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Back to you, Mustafa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olsen. Uh, I think uh, here also highlighted that, that the energy industry ramping up in increasing numbers. Uh, with different projects in specifically renewable energy, uh, in which it's uh, really good because uh, we are seeing a healthy growth. And maybe if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh, we would have seen a faster growth as what we have heard from Ocean. Uh, before going next, I would like to remind the audience that uh, you can directly post your question in our Q&A box. Uh, please do so, so we can answer your question later on in our Q&A panel discussion. Uh, without further ado, allow us to go to the next speaker. We have Miss Lisa, which is going to talk about the renewable energy and the challenges and the opportunities. Lisa, everyone, welcome, Miss Lisa. Hi, everyone. I am a Chief Financial Officer, Officer of Malaysian Solar Resources. And uh, today I want to speak about renewable energy where the challenges and opportunities lies. Um, next slide, please. 
So as you can see that uh, my, my next slide, uh, it says about the Malaysian primary uh, fuel uh, in 2017, um, you will be looking at crude oil and natural gas. Uh, it's natural because uh, Malaysia is a big producer of natural gas and crude oil, uh, obviously. Um, next slide. Um, in two, from this graph, uh, this chart, you can see that the energy mix from 2007 to 2017, uh, there is still a very heavy reliance on crude oil and uh, natural gas as well. But we do see that, uh, you know, the, the bits of purple, uh, the purple bits on, at the top, um, you see that there are more and more uh, solar implementation happening in the country at the moment from, I think, 2009, uh, start, uh, starting from 2009 to 2017. Next, please. Um, one of the major reasons for uh, the opportunities uh, around the area of solar, uh, particularly solar, um, uh, but you are, you are also seeing it in wind offshore, onshore, biomass and biogas is because the, there's a continuous cost reduction in terms of uh, the capex of the project. Uh, and from this chart, we uh, I like to point out that you see that there is a huge decrease in the LCOE. Um, LCOE basically just means the levelized cost of energy or electricity. It's a term that describes the cost of power produced by solar over a period of time. So typically where the, uh, the warranted life of the solar system. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's decreasing like uh, drastically like every year. Uh, hence, it makes sense uh, for the solar installation and it makes sense um, that uh, renewable energy will reach good parity quite soon. Next, uh, next slide. Um, so at the moment in Malaysia, uh, in Malaysia, there is a huge drive uh, to for large scale solar for uh, as you can see that it's part of the government policy to stimulate the economy through um, opening up the large scale solar for actually this opening of the large scale solar for is much uh, quicker than I think the what the when the industrial players think it would be um, it opened I think uh, just after the MCO uh, just after the lockdown in Malaysia uh, June, I think, was it May, May or June? Yeah. So, but you, you can see that it's part of the policy, uh, government policy to stimulate the eco economy with uh, large scale solar. And it just goes to show that this is an uh, renewable energy is a sector, it's a very important sector for the government at the moment. And this does not only apply to Malaysia, but it also applies to like uh, countries like Vietnam, uh, countries like uh, I'm talking about Southeast Asia. Our regional of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Taiwan, uh, Myanmar, Thailand has uh, Thailand has already been um, uh, has already grown quite quickly uh, in in this uh, area of uh, large scale solar farm, uh, large scale energy uh, uh, production. So, but uh, the rest of Asia is catching up, and they are catching up really really quickly. Next slide, please. So. Um, as I was mentioning, that part of the uh, part of the part of the challenge uh, for each country um, is the economic recovery after the pandemic, and a lot of sectors, for example, retail sectors and various of other business sectors, unless you're in like glove production or mass production, that's a different story. But there are a lot of sectors affected by the pandemic, and one of the biggest like. Uh, plan for the government and very important plan is um, to really focus uh, a lot of resources into the, the, the renewable energy sector. And therefore, I see a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, multiplier effects that will come uh, because of this um, uh, uh, focus by, by our government. Um, next slide. Uh, However, like uh, there are also like challenges that has happened in uh, renewable energy because there, 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 there are a couple of postponements of projects, but I believe that this is only a glitch and um, 
after this glitch, it will be a long term uh, plan by the government that they were they will continuously put a lot of resources and efforts into this area. Next, please. Um, so the benefits of renewable energy, uh, I will speak particularly about solar. Uh, you have uh, free and unlimited sources of energy. So the sun is your feedstock. So it makes sense. And, and solar is a very, it's a proven technology and um, it has proven track record and it has data. It has like, I think in Malaysia, it has at least like, uh, for at least five years of data. There are some projects with eight years of data. So it is there, it's been generating income. It's been, um, uh, it has produced the output that we can accurately or uh, reasonably ac accurately manage, uh, I mean, uh, forecast. So banks and financial institutions, uh, private equity, they're all very keen in this sector. Other than the fact that um, social, corporate responsibility, it's uh, it's very big on every multinationals, every corporation's uh, agenda as well. Um, it just makes sense. Next. Next slide, yeah. So as you, uh, uh, I mean, doing, I'm talking particularly about solar, you know, you can put the panels up on like unutilized uh, uh, land or water surface and that, uh, helps with like uh you know saving of space and things like that. So you have a lot of like rooftop installations and lakes and things like that as well. Next, please. Um, yeah, the third slide basically just says that it reduced the dependence on non-renewable energy sources. Uh, like what Austin have have mentioned. Um, and uh, I believe that this area is a sector to stay. Uh. Uh, thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, we'll be answering it at the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisa. And actually, it's, it's great to see Malaysia doing uh, multiple projects in the same time and expectations of growth in the renewable sector in the next five years. I will be from 2% to 20%. That is 10 times as compared to 2017. Uh, so we are seeing a great improvement and that hopefully will lead us to a brighter future and a healthier environment. Uh, without further ado, I have to go to the Q&A sessions. We have um, some of the questions that have been raised by our audience. Uh, we have our first question, uh, which is saying that, how do you see bio, biogas and biomass as two of the main renewable energy sector in ASEAN? Um, I would like to, to hear um, from all the speakers um, their view or their comment regarding this question. So we will start with uh, Mr. Adlan. Uh, Mr. Adlan, please, welcome. Okay, um, the question on biogas and biomass. Well, with any renewable energy, you really want to maximize or optimize your local available resources. And ASEAN being near the equatorial belt, and we have a good uh, amount of sunshine as well as rain. You know, this is promotes a, a great growth of biomass and biogas opportunities. Now, even in Malaysia, ourselves, our second largest um, revenue of the country comes from palm oil. Uh, so I know there are a lot of issues regarding this, but if you just simply looking at the palm oil as an edible oil that we need to produce, you know, this produces a lot of waste as well that can be used as a form of renewable energy. As we produce the community, we produce waste and the waste will become your biomass and your biogas. And similarly, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia is, is doing this as well. Uh, so coming back to, to that question for Southeast Asian region, this is the, the great location for exploiting biomass and biogas. And in effect, there are actually solar energy that is being absorbed through the plants that we are releasing back as a chemical form. Uh, at the same time, we also get food yeah, to, to cater to our food security. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Alan. Um, going to Mr. Alan. Um, so what is your view about the, the question that Rain raised? Is how do you see biogas and biomass as two of the main renewable energy sources in Asia? Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> biogas and, and biomass, uh, the 
from my uh, from my understanding is very much based on the raw material, the availability of raw material, uh, and how close that raw material is to the processing plants, which in turn uh, uh, relate to how close are these uh, plants to the the, uh, the national grid, uh, the power power systems. Uh, one other point is that in, in looking at biomass, uh, you know, biomass in particular, what is the raw material that's going to be used for biomass? And uh, there's been a number of uh, uh, videos uh, where we see that maybe it's uh, in some cases not so uh, ethical, not so uh, not so renewable in terms of the products being used for biomass. So that, <clears throat> there's a, a few. Uh, a few questions that have been raised in, in the, the biomass area. Uh, biogas, uh, yeah, a lot of development uh, uh, still ongoing there, so uh, that's as much as I want to see on that right now. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, go to Mr. Austin. So, same question How do you see the biogas and biomass as two of the main renewable energy sources in Asia? All right, thank you, Mustafa. So as far as I know, there are actually no uh, regulation to like the, looking at the policy framework. There are no regulation to control the export of biomass fiber or the restriction on the release of biogas into the atmosphere. So it's like the open pond. So the policy actually could have uh, addressed more the financial option. And also like, for example, like for the millers, the palm oil millers. So they will release the palm oil mill effluent, which we call it POME. So is it cheaper to uh, for them? It's cheaper to adopt a ponding system that has a lower operating cost, which allow all the uh, biogas to escape into atmosphere. But there is uh, there needs to be an uh, regulation to capture all the biogas from the anaerobic digestion of the pond. So eventually, this will shift the practice of having an open ponding system to a biogas plant. Also, like uh, for example, like the uh, remote area in Sabah, mills that are located close together. Uh, but far from the grid connection. So maybe they can uh, be clustered to form a mini grid system for rural application. Thank you. That's uh, my answer. Okay, thank you, Mr. Austin. Um, going to Ms. Alicia. Ms. Um, what is your point of view on um, how do you see uh, biogas and biomass as the two of the main renewable energy sources in Asia? Hi, I'm just going to go really quickly on this because uh, biomass and biogas as a main source of uh, energy fuel in Southeast Asia are probably not fantastic uh, 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 strategy, uh, mainly because uh, there's the uh, feedstock which you require. Um, so therefore, I don't think you can do that in large scales. Uh, uh, I think people, uh, for huge like palm oil producers like Saim Darby, Kuala Lumpur Kapong, KLK, um, they have done it but at a at a much at pockets of like uh, small projects, small biomass projects like two megawatt to uh, five megawatt is considered large. So I think that's I don't think it, it's a very uh, uh, scalable to a massive extent, but it is still doable for uh, the industrial players. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lisa. Uh, before I'm going to the next uh, question, uh, I would like just to a quick remind the audience that uh, while you are posting your question in our chat, uh, please um, um, write the, the, the speakers that you are directing this question to. Thank you. Um, okay, for the second um, second question, we have um, a direct to Mr. Adlan. Mr. Adlan, one of the audience is asking, uh, how can I become a chartered engineer under the Energy Institute? Okay, first you have to become a member. I think that is a, a given. So uh, really, a CNG or, or chartership is, is for people who have uh, some um, level of competencies. So we are looking for people who have been actively involved in, in the technical knowledge for at least three to five years before, before you apply. And being uh, under the Royal Charter, the Energy Institute is allowed to uh, is licensed uh, to give CNs under the Energy Council UK. And uh, of course, the first step you have to become a member, either affiliate or associate member. 
once you have your your membership details then if you are ready to apply you can actually go to our website to download the application pack but uh, i think it's it's better if you can join one of our webinars we actually do membership uh, webinars or registration webinars quite regularly and this will be informed through your email when when it occurs this will give you a better step-by-step uh, -step guideline uh, in order to achieve your CNs. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Adlan. Uh, we have a second question uh, directed to Mr. Allen. Uh, Mr. Allen, one of the audience is asking, will oil and gas industry be uh, negatively affected with this shift uh, to renewable energy? Uh I don't uh, foresee them being negatively negatively uh, affected in the medium to long term. Short term, of course, uh, we, we've seen the, the swings in the, the uh, price of oil and the impact it's had on, uh, on, on, on jobs uh, due to uh, oversupply and under demand. Uh, but you can see from most of the slide pack, the, the, uh, the oil majors are now changing tack uh, their, their strategies are much more forward-looking in terms of the transition into renewables. That's all part of the energy mix, <clears throat> where they, they will maintain their footprint in the conventional energy sector, uh, while also looking at opportunities in, in renewables. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's all about the transition, uh, and it's uh, the, the smooth transition across. We are uh, the, the mix will always be there. Uh, up to 2050, we can gradually see the, the reduction in hydrocarbon production in favour of renewables. Uh, but for the renewable sector, uh, one of the big issues is, uh, is storage, and uh, that's an area that, that, that needs to be addressed in the renewable sector also. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, going to the next uh, question is directed to Mr. Olson. Uh, Mr. Olson, one of the audience is asking, Will we see the government uh, subsidizing renewable energy more compared to the oil and gas soon in the future? Oh, sorry, Mr. Buckingham. Uh, yes, Austin, you want me to repeat the question again? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. So uh, one of the audience is asking, uh, will we see the government subsidizing renewable energy more compared to the oil and gas soon in the future? Ah, okay. Thank you for your question. Okay. So actually, uh, right now, as we on, as I have mentioned just now, the level, uh, the imbalance playing field. So right now, the fossil fuel is uh, subsidized and uh, supported by the government. So uh, the subsidy to renewable energy is depend, actually depends on the government policy. So we do really hope to see more subsidy for the uh, renewable energy. And uh, because like our target is to achieve 20% of the renewable energy in the gener generation mix by 2035. And how to uh, like balance it up to uh, have more renewable energy. So maybe one thing that uh, we can think of like is the three items that released by the uh, uh, fossil fuel, which is the damage to climate change, uh, damage from the health cause of the uh, air pollution, yeah, and the traffic congestion. So one of the things that I can think of is maybe to impose the carbon tax. So carbon tax is to uh, actually impose to the uh, people to uh, actually admit or use more uh, private vehicle that admits the carbon by fossil fuel. So the more you admit, the more carbon you admit, the more you have to pay for the tax. So this will eventually uh, help to uh, reduce the demand for private vehicle usage and slowly we shift to more uh, efficient energy efficiency and renewable energy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Austin, for your answer. Um, okay, we have a second question um, is directed to Ms. Lisa. Uh, Ms. Lisa, one of the audience is asking, Will be there developments in the other areas of renewable energy other than wind and solar in Malaysia? That I believe that there will be, uh, because China, like for example, in China, they are already uh, developing um, hydrogen, and uh, and it's 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 a pretty disruptive technology as well. Uh, when you when you're talking about other areas of the renewable energy, I think uh, wind and solar and mini hydro, biogas, biomass, they're all in Malaysia already. 
um, it's just at which at what scale uh, is it uh, being uh, done in Malaysia so um, yeah I think I think uh, uh, when 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 you're talking about what an, other energy uh, sources um, yeah it, it's it's already all there so yeah that's the answer thank you okay thank you Ms. Ms. Um we have another question that's directed to Mr. Adlan uh, Mr. Adlan one of the audience is asking does energy news in Malaysia events have uh, collectible CPD points? Okay, thank you for the question. Well, it actually depends on, on what events is being, being held. And these CPD points, and the, they, they come in many different forms as well. For example, we have done a, a solar workshop where we uh, requested from Energy Commission to, to allow CPD points for their Energy Manager program, Energy Manager Certificate. And that was one of our previous experience. We have also been working with IEM as well to collect CPD points if the uh, training is related to any of their technical region. So again, it, it will depends on the training itself. And we have done in the past and we will do again require um, or apply for CPD points where applicable. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adlan. Okay. Um... So to the second question, we have um, one of the audience is asking, uh, Mr. Austin, oh, sorry, Mr. Allen, uh, one of the audience is asking that, will we see collaboration between different industries, such as, such as oil and gas and renewable energy? Yes, uh, most, uh, most certainly. Uh, what we we have seen is that a number of uh, companies have moved across from purely uh, oil and gas to the renewable sector, or step being one. Uh, we also see uh, some rebranding, uh, Statoil, uh, who are Nor Norway's oil and gas uh, uh, producer, now rebranded as Equinor to cover uh, both sectors uh, of, of energy. Uh, so there, there will be a collaboration and. Uh, through the, the Energy Institute, uh, many of these companies who are corporate members, they, they collaborate. Uh, we have uh, technical subcommittees in specific areas of both uh, the conventional and renewable energy sectors, where these companies do come together and collaborate and develop a cutting edge, uh, forward thinking uh, papers on on how we can manage the, the hydrocarbon, uh, the, the, the conventional energy sector, and how we can develop the renewable energy sector. Uh, one level under that, the uh, oil and gas service companies, we know that here in, in Malaysia, with our relationship with the Energy Industries Council, and also from MOXIE, uh, where these service companies uh, also providing uh, services to both the conventional sector and now providing uh, services to the renewable sector, they also need to collaborate as well. And, and what we're trying to do uh, in not just Malaysia, but in the region, is to have a more joined up approach where we can bring these organizations together and we can work uh, and collaborate to the benefit of everyone, a win-win, no matter which side of the, the fence you're on, be it conventional or, or renewable. Okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. I'm going to the next question is directly to Mr. Austin. Uh, Mr. Austin, one of the audience is asking, uh, what are the health damage involved that can come from renewable energy? Is it really clean as the industry call it clean energy? Okay, thank you, Mushaba. So uh, this uh, question is very controversial, but one thing I can say that the clean energy is definitely cleaner than a fossil fuel. This is for sure. But one of the things that might be controversial is uh, how could the people produce all those like uh, renewable energy equipment such as the solar panel and wind turbines? Of course, things must have the uh, their pro and cons. So looking at this, how do they produce the solar panel and the wind turbine structure or, or anything else? So it's still the they still using the electricity which come from the grid. And where does the electric from the grid come from? It's also mainly from coal fire power plant and the gas fire power plant. But one thing, uh, one of the study actually uh, say that uh, 
the one one units of the uh, solar power plant can actually generate 24 units of the electricity so the ratio is 1 to 24 and for wind turbine is even more efficient the ratio is 1 to 40 which means one unit of uh, electricity used to produce the wind turbine uh, it will produce 40 units of the electricity thank you thank you mr austin uh, jumping to the second question, it's directed to Ms. Lisa. Uh, Ms. Lisa, one of the um, audience is asking, can biogas and, and biofuel in general be an important source of energy in Malaysia? The answer to that is yes, and it is already an important uh, energy source in Malaysia, especially for uh, the palm oil uh, mills. Um, they have been recycling and reusing uh, the palm oil effluents to uh, reproduce energy through biomass and also biogas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Lisa. Uh, okay, so going to the second question. Uh, second question also directed to you, Ms. Lisa. Uh, one of the audience is also asking, uh, looking at solar energy, do you see the future in PV or CSP? Uh, do I see the future in PV or CSP? Um, yes, definitely. <laughs> There's always a future in PV or CSV. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lisa. Uh, okay, um, another question is directed to, I believe, to Mr. Allen. Uh, Mr. Allen, now one of the audience is asking that a solar panel energy output will drop significantly after about 25 years of use. Uh, do you think that uh, will discourage the investment on this field by big oil and gas players as the later field will light higher profit? Uh, that's a, a really good question. Because uh, in terms of uh, profits and uh, dividends to shareholders, oil and gas has uh, historically been seen as a, a really good investment. Uh, of course, there's been fluctuations, but generally, uh, oil and gas is uh, is been a, is 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 offered good returns for investors. For uh, the move into renewables, uh, so renewables is obviously the the future, uh, predominantly the, the, the future, and I think there's going to be a, there's going to have to be a bit of a, a shift in in thinking in terms of shareholders' expectations in terms of what the what the returns uh, could be from from renewables compared to uh, oil and gas okay thank you mr uh, allen uh, i think mr dr adlan uh, wants to say something regarding the question um dr adlan Uh, Dr. Adlan, uh, you would like to comment regarding the question that being asked? Yeah, I think on on the investment, of, of course, they they will always uh, look at the long term um, uh, picture. But um, I think by that time, you know, the, we will we, we might have also introduced new technologies and innovation that that may change the the landscape. So it's it's very hard to predict you know, 25 years down the line. Just yeah. yes, just adding my two cents. Okay, I can see. Uh, actually, um, there's another question that is directly directed to you, this Dr. Adlan. So uh, one of the audience is asking that as recent graduates, job demands for chemical engineering are few and far between. What are some of the ways to improve my employability, chances, networking opportunities to get a job in this industry? Uh, so what, what advice can I say is is um, not to limit yourself to to a single um, industry or sector. Um, traditionally, even even globally, the highest employer of chemical engineering graduates is the oil and gas industry. Uh, but then it's the same thing. Eh? I mean, in Malaysia, the highest uh, employer for chemical engineers is involved in oil. Either oil we dig from the ground or oil that we grow on the trees. Uh, so the palm oil industry is also the biggest employer of chemical engineers. So this is something that you can do. You, you try to um, 
diversify and not only looking at one industry. When you do your projects or when you do your, your assignments, try to find uh, something that is related to sustainability, which is always uh, an ongoing uh, issue at the moment. And yeah, I mean, not, not to limit oil and gas only. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Alan. Uh, we have another question directed to Mr. Awesome. Mr. Awesome, what are the developments to address the dot curve in solar energy generation? So the dot curve, okay, this is a very interesting topic. So uh, I would like to explain a bit on the dot curve first. Dark curve is actually is a graph of the uh, power production and the power consumption uh, over a day. So it's actually show the imbalance uh, between the peak demand and the solar energy production. So the curve normally we see is going up like that. Though so when during the daytime, there's a lot of uh, solar energy. So of course your demand will goes from high and then you will go a curve like that. So it forms a dark curve. So how do we do this? So it's actually, uh, this study is actually done, by, uh, done in California during springtime. So it is more extreme, the effect is most extreme because uh, it's sunny, but the temperature remains cold. So uh, there's no need for air conditioning system over there. But in Malaysia, we still need air conditioning system over here because we are not four season country. And one of the things that uh, government is looking at, I think is because, uh, I think is, uh, government start to develop more green buildings over here, which is also named as the energy efficient building. So uh, even during, I mean, going all the way, the dark curve is going like this. So when during nighttime, if uh, more energy efficient building, then the energy demand would be that high. So it will not uh, form a very extreme dark curve over here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Austin. Um, I have another question directed to Ms. Lisa. Uh, this is one of the audience is asking outlook for floating solar in malaysia any upcoming projects and how do they compete against land-based solar projects um, for floating solar in malaysia i think there is uh, a project uh, about 10 megawatt down south um, that happened in a large-scale solar farm too um, i think uh, the outlook for floating solar in malaysia it's, it's very good uh, because one of the major thing is you don't have to compete uh, in terms of land um, and the regulations. The only thing is the regulations are being uh, uh, are a bit uh, more gray. So you have to actually check if um, uh, there's you know uh, different kinds of permits. There are um, you at the same time you know there's very strict requirements from Department of uh, Environment as well on the use of uh, 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 large water bodies like lakes or um, shore, uh, pond, so that there are very, very strict criteria and very strict uh, uh, regulations that are uh, imposed on uh, floating solar. Um, but, uh, but at the end of it, I am still uh, very positive about the uh, uh, floating solar projects. Um, as compared to land, uh, because that's using like water bodies that are, I guess, not used, not utilized. Um, and I, I mean, at the same time, I could probably answer uh, Sally T's uh, question as well. That the uh, that the um, yeah, I think it was addressing uh, it was addressing the uh, uh, environment when solar panels are built on empty land and forests are locked off uh, and replaced by solar panel, I think um, there are very, very strict requirements, very strict requirements uh, that are uh, imposed on like um, large scale solars, which are imposed by the uh, Department of Environment as well as like um, all the various uh, 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 states uh, requirements as well. So it's actually not, not so, um, not so easy to uh, execute in that sense. And it's actually um, looking after every single aspect of the environment as well, like uh, the, ensuring there's no fishery uh, around that, that area and things like that. So um, yeah, so that's the answer to like some of the questions that was in the Q&A as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisa. Uh, coming to the second question to directly to Mr. Allen. 
Uh, Mr. Allen, as someone experienced in the oil and gas for over 35 years, has there been any new development that can produce more of the oil reserves, maybe maxing the recovery to 60 to 70 percent? So, yes, there, there are significant uh, reserves of oil and gas uh, on our planet. Uh, you recall the, uh, on the news, on the media, uh, uh, in the, the Arctic, uh, plans to explore the Arctic, uh, Greenland, uh, whole areas which uh, is reckoned there's, there's large reserves. Uh, but. Uh, we've stepped away from uh, from exploiting uh, the, these these oil and gas reserves uh, because we see the move towards renewables as the most ethical way forward. Uh, in in mature uh, basins, the recovery uh, typically is uh, 40, 50, 60 percent. Uh, any more recovery than that requires additional technology. Uh, some of it's been developed over the years, of course, but to extract 100% of the reserves is virtually impossible without a significant investment in technology, uh, which uh, uh, most would argue would be better, uh, better invested in the renewable sector. Okay, thank you, Mr. Okay. Allen. Um, another question directed to Mr. Adlan. Uh, one of the audience is asking, countries such as the USA, India, China, and Saudi Arabia all see a significant future for the use of hydrocarbons through CCUS and the development of the hydrogen economy. What is the panel's view? Okay, thank you for directing me this question. The panel's view. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, CCUS uh, stands for Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage. So in these four letters, uh, only U is the one that can actually bring about any revenue. Carbon capture and storage is, is still very expensive. And at the moment, we have a few demonstration plants, but none, none uh, uh, fully commercial plant done yet. But this is seen as, as a good um, uh, uh, avenue or a good method uh, to, to prolong our, our use of uh, fossil fuel. In my own view, it's okay if it's locally done. You know, if, if you have a, a ready use of a carbon and it can make the economic sense to store as well, so if the carbon doesn't get released to the atmosphere, why not? You know, and the IEA actually estimated that the CCUS, if it's really um, took off, can uh, reduce one sixth or can capture one sixth of the total carbon emission by 2050. So this is something that a lot of countries are looking at. Unfortunately, it's still very expensive uh, for, I think, Southeast Asia to, to go into this, this area. The other one is uh, hydrogen. Again, um, something new as well. And as, as a developing uh, area or developing countries, we might not have the capacity to actually um, explore this too much. The hydrogen now comes in, you can you can say largely in two forms the green hydrogen which you you create from uh, renewable energy or as at the moment the largest form of hydrogen is still the blue hydrogen which comes from steam reforming and this involves uh, actually using coal or methane from coal beds so this is again you know uh, in the future it, it it will it will be much bigger hydrogen is the, one of the cleanest combustion of fuel it is a fuel we have over 100 years of experience using fuel so we are I think we can handle hydrogen like, uh, of course, not like any other fuels, but you know, we we will be able to handle hydrogen. It's just that something this recent or this new is not uh, what I see will happen in Southeast Asia the, in the near future. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Adlan. Uh, I think we, we reach our uh, end of our event today. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for their precious time and also for their um, curious question that they have been asked the speakers. Uh, I'd like to remind that the Windows to Generation 2050 page will automatically open following this webinar. Uh, please do have a look and fill in the survey. And also a recording of this webinar will also be made available following the webinar. 
Uh, lastly, I would like to thank our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Adlan. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And thank you, Mr. Austin, as well. And thank you, Ms. Lisa. Uh, also, last but not least, I would like to thank our supporting partners, uh, Ripso, Sunpik, and IPM. Without further ado, thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you.